person we can yeah, get. Yeah, just to Okay, sorry about that. So this is our clinical um, center of excellence workshop. And the purpose of this is to, we have wonderful panelists who I'll inter introduce in a minute, but for, particularly for those who are on the clinician educator um, track. Um, and I'll talk about the CEP in just a second as well. But one of the sections on the CEP really dis it has a large focus on clinical excellence. And a number of people have developed expertise in particular areas and have developed centers. And that goes a long way towards promotion, career satisfaction, um, and so forth, and also um, you know, career goals. So we ask them to come and give you some words of wisdom about how they got started, developed their center, and what that's meant from a standpoint of collaborations and career success and career advancement. Um, we'll have a brief uh, introduction of the panelists. The format will be each person will come up and give about an eight minute presentation regarding their center or career. We'll have a few moments for questions. I wanted to save some time at the end so we can have just more of a sort of general discussion, but I think a couple of people have to leave early, so we will take time for a few questions right after the individual presentations. I'll talk just a little bit about the CEP overview. That'll take about five minutes as to how this applies, and then we'll have our um, wrap-up. And just as a reminder, um, from the standpoint of Office of Faculty Development, our goal is to try to provide resources for your professional and personal development, and hopefully everyone will achieve academic and clinical excellence in a supportive environment. So this is our way of being um, supportive. So with us today, we have Dr. Matt Shorba, who's the Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of GI and is Director of the Inflammatory Bio Disease Center. Um, Dr. Ann Goldberg, um, who says she does not have a center, but um, if it were called a center, it would be the Center of Lipid Disorders because she's our go-to person for lipidology. Um, Brian Kim, Associate per um, Professor in Dermatology, who's co-director of the Center for the Study of Itch. Um, Kate Lindley, um, in the Division of Cardiology, Director for the Center for Women's Heart Disease. And Tom Maddox, who's uh, also in cardiology, but Executive Director of the Healthcare Innovations Lab. So, um, Matt, we're going to get started with you. Um, okay, sounds good. So, great. Thanks a lot, Angela, uh, sure. for organizing this. And um, I, I'm going to tell you the story about the development of our, our IBD Center, or the Crohn's and Colitis Center. Um, and I would say that this really sort of came together now about three and a half or four years ago. And, and the impetus for this was that um, I'd, I'd been here since 2007 on the faculty and had been doing clinical work in IBD and doing some research, and I knew that there was a big uh, research community and a lot of people that were interested in inflammatory bowel disease, including um, uh, our clinicians, uh, uh, pediatric uh, IBD center, colorectal surgeons. This is one of the larger colorectal surgery programs in the country, uh, a great uh, imaging institute at Mallinckrodt, and, uh, and a number of scientists. And, and basically the issue is, is that there was no central focus point for this. And our clinical group itself was not quite big enough to support the interactions. And so uh, many of our, what I really thought was is that we, while we had all these great things, it was a very siloed approach and there wasn't much cross interaction. Uh, even though we had 70 faculty with IBD specialty training, uh, we'd been a top recipient of Crohn's and Colitis Foundation research dollars for more than 10 years, and we were amongst the highest volume IBD centers in the, in the world. But despite that, we didn't have a, a center. So I had to think about who was involved in patient care, IBD patient <sighs> care, and really came up with the idea that we had new patients coming in. These would go into our GI specialist. Uh, there were some patients coming into colorectal surgeons, and then really we would feed the rest of this uh, rest of the system, uh, including infusion centers, GI pathology, anesthesia, GI radiology, lab services, and and research. We also had a, a heavy research focus on IBD, uh, but the the many of our clinicians were not totally connected to that. And why is the Department of Medicine or the school or whatever interested? It turns out that it's actually fairly. Uh, uh, profitable and or expensive, depending on how you look at it, to take care of patients with IBD. 
uh, and the patients in particular that we're taking care of here at WashU were more complicated patients, and so many of these are, are nearly like $50,000 a year in, in patient care. Uh, but our problem is, is that we had this bottleneck of IBD specialists, so we really only had a few different IBD specialists. Our uh, new referrals were going up, our, our wait time was more than five months, and, uh, and as a result, the rest of the system really was somewhat fractionated. Uh, fraction. We had delays in patient care, missed clinical revenue, and, uh, and, and really missed opportunities, I thought, for research grants as well as philanthropic opportunities. Many places around the country had already had named IBD centers, uh, whereas here, even though we had one of the top research places and one of the busiest services, services nobody knew about us. Uh, and so we really had to figure out a way to, to expand this. So I would say that probably the key thing that I did in order to help generate this, uh, this center was participating in this academic medical leadership program for physicians and scientists. Uh, they have an abbreviation, although I don't think anyone ever said AMLPPS. Um, and this leadership program that was really sort of a collaboration between the School of Business, the School of Law, BJC, and all of their uh, various things, and then, uh, and then with the Department of Medicine, um, put together this, this program, and it was over the course of six months. Uh, maybe, has anyone else in this here attended that program? Um, and I think that, that was really very helpful for me in thinking about how do you create your vision and mission for what the center is, defining what your operational and organizational requirements are, and then developing a, uh, a, a plan of execution for this. And so much of what I'm showing here is really in part what we developed along the, uh, along the way with that. Now I will say that uh, you had a team of five people, and it turned out that they all worked on, on my project, was, which was convenient, although many people in my group also uh, worked on their own projects sort of separately and have built their own centers uh, since that time. So there was an investment from GI and Department of Medicine in that, and really our vision was to develop this comprehensive IBD center that would, at Washington University that would align many of our central interests, create a resource to optimize clinical IBD operations, expand our research endeavors, and then foster new philanthropic opportunities. So we came up with, uh, came up with this, the idea of, of world-class patient care, transformative research, and then educating the next generation of clinicians and science. And so this is our mission statement there that you can see. I've got a, a fair number of, of slides and I'm happy to share this with anybody. So I'm just sort of going over this with, as, as a general overview uh, and then have a few final talking points. So in the last now three or so years, we ended up, uh, once we had this vision and, and mission that people could buy into, I think it was much easier to recruit faculty because they could see where the center was going. Um, and we initially recruited three and then four uh, faculty. And in fact, since I've been here now, five faculty into the IBD program. So we're now the largest group within the division of gastroenterology. We represent a, almost a, about a third of the total clinical group. Um, and so we address that, uh, that, that bottleneck. Um, we now have ended up hiring on uh, new nurse practitioners physician ex uh, as physician extenders. We've incorporated in with the division's health psychologist, and then we wrote a grant in order to get a IBD dietitian, which is mostly what patients wanted. And that grant came from pharma, and then after, the, after I funded this person's position for about nine months, the Department of Medicine or the GI division picked that up and rolled that into our, uh, into our business model. So really taking that advantage of writing a grant, bringing somebody on, and then, uh, and then showing it the value of it. Uh, we also really worked to get shared clinical space with the colorectal surgeons so that we would have uh, GI physicians aligned with the colorectal surgeons so there was clear communication of plans and, and they would get to uh, uh, collaborate. So we had a lot of growth. Um, across all of these areas. We enhanced patient uh, care and clinical revenue. Do you know how much uh, money we, uh, more money we brought in in the last three years? I don't either, but the, uh, uh, those books are kept secret. But the, uh, but I would say that the, uh, uh, but, but, I, but I, I have a feeling that it's been a substantial, uh, substantial growth in the, in the division as well. 
We also hired some new clinical trial coordinators uh, and enhanced and, and uh, have, have brought on new research grants and uh, philanthropy and, and, uh, and, and publications. So this is just a picture of our group and it actually doesn't, doesn't include everybody at this time. Those are some of the people that we brought on. The support staff, it turns out that taking care of IBD patients is, is pretty complicated and so we really had to figure out how to align our support staff. We now have however many people are up there in some fashion or another. And, and try to have defined roles for each individual and also for the ability to, um, uh, ability to adapt when people leave or people get, uh, people get sick because it seems like that's a, a very frequent thing on our, on our clinical side of things. So during that course of time, I think actually this is outdated. We probably have hired about 15 new uh, clinic support staff and research support staff. We brought in more than 3,000 new patients. We shortened our wait time down to a week at one time. We expanded to locations at South County and West County and, uh, and really developed further relationships with our colorectal surgeons. We've had a lot of new grants, uh, research publications uh, in, in not only uh, uh, in IBD specialty journals, but also in, in uh, um, cutting edge scientific journals. And then we've developed a number of new collaborations. We brought on a bunch of new clinical trials as well, which I think has been helpful in the community. And, and then one other thing that we did is really increase our educational um, presence. And so we developed these gut clubs. So a few times a year we have community gut clubs where we have this is essentially pharma sponsored and it would be like going to a drug dinner in the old days, except for the fact that we control the speaker and the benefit is, is that we bring in this outside speaker uh, they get to meet with all of our faculty, meet with some fellows, and then they give a community, uh, a community education program, and that helps build in, the, build in the referrals as well. We also have a day-long CME course that we started, which is on April 4th, if anyone's interested. We started an advanced IBD fellowship. We got uh, funding through industry, essentially, to support uh, this role, and it's been successful, at least in this first year, the person that we brought on as an IBD fellow is now joining our, our faculty. We also uh, worked with the National Foundation, uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, to be, particip be a, a participating uh, center in their visiting IBD fellowship program. And this has also been useful. I think the first person that we brought through, which was actually just month last month, is now interested in, in uh, looking at faculty positions and where they previously may not have considered WashU. Now we're probably the leading center where they want to, uh, where they want to come to. And then we've worked to develop uh, new philanthropic uh, um, uh, relationships as, as well, including uh, patient-started programs and then through the Office of, of uh, Faculty, uh, Office of whatever it is, Foundation Development. Um, there's a lot of growing pains, though, that come with it. A lot of things happen. Uh, people join, people leave. Uh, and so, you know, just a few comments of, of having uh, a little bit of sense of the pace as you're building and having a good structure in place, having good support people, um, particularly in the uh, um, uh, nursing support uh, so that they can help you in organizing in those many various different people. So that's actually the, those are the main things. We have a handout and I, and I summarized a few of those thoughts, but those are sort of the, uh, the main things that I would say is, is, is that a lot of connections with the, uh, um, um, with industry support, thinking clearly about what your mission and vision is, uh, recruiting faculty who you're going to want to work with for the long term and who you think are going to be um, good partners, and, and to work with the Office of Faculty Development. I, I know I shut it down. That's fine. So, so the rest of those things are all in the uh, um, are all in the handout. Is there any specific questions in this uh, short term? I'm going to stick around for the panel. Any questions for Rich? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, in part, bringing on new faculty then uh, then brings in new, okay. and and I would say that infusion dollars have supported a lot of this. So you get the access uh, no. Okay. 
No, but I mean, I think that the, the department sees the value uh, through some of that. Um, and then GI clinicians do colonoscopies. Uh, yeah, so bringing, in, so bringing in new physicians who are doing more colonoscopies has also been helpful with that. Yeah. Yeah. Rish? Well, I mean, it's, that's, uh, that's a real challenge, and I think that's one thing you have to be, uh, you know, be, be, be aware of. I mean, my uh, uh, division chief would tell me that, uh, um, you know, all these ups and downs build resilience and uh, compartmentalize your time and all those sort of things. I mean, um, I, I think you just have to think very carefully about where you want to pray. You know, where, how, how you want to prioritize your time and, and, uh, and who are the people. So one thing I did when, when I started this clinical center is I hired a, a instructor level faculty PhD to help in my laboratory to help organize things. And that was probably a very key, um, a very key thing for me in order to uh, have a little bit of my time uh, separated away, uh, away from that. I think the other thing is, is that I've done research, you know, just research in my own clinics for 10 years. I looked around at other positions, I looked at division chief positions and, and cancer center positions, and, and what I ultimately decided is, is that for me, for my own personal mission, is that creating an IBD center and really focusing in that area was going to be worth it uh, to me. And I was not interested in, um, I was not interested in dedicating 100% of my time to research, and I just knew the clinical part, you know, the running clinical things were still of, of interest to me. And so that was really a personal decision. And I would say, you know, sometimes I'm thinking myself when the uh, uh, faculty leave or other you know, staff related things. Um, but at the same time, you know, the bigger rewards are, um, uh, uh, are I think, that's going to work. And, and, you know, the, the ability to grow a center that really has national recognition. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I don't have slides. Um, I feel like kind of the outlier here uh, since I don't really have a center. Um, so it may not be formally called a center. <laughs> right. Well, anyway. So um, basically, what, the way I got into this was that as, at the end of fellowship, I was doing neuroendocrinology and lab research, discovered I was not a bench researcher at all and did not have a job. And Gus Schoenfeld, who had the Lipid Research Center here, which had been established in 1973, uh, needed me to help do clinical trials and clinical work because two people left. Um, so I started working with Gus, who was a really great mentor. So I think a lot of it, a lot of stuff depends on, uh, to some extent, on serendipity. But then you have to kind of take the chances when the doors open and walk through them because I immediately started learning about lipids and seeing patients and getting involved in the clinical trials and other research. And in fact, at July um, of 93, when I first joined, um, I went to a big international meeting in Philadelphia, and then Gus introduced me to people from all over the country and all over the world. So I started making connections immediately. And with his mentorship, uh, getting into the research projects and clinical work, um, and actually, he was very generous about writing projects and giving me the opportunity to do first author publications. Makes a big difference. Eventually, um, instead of being the sub-I, sub-investigator on the pharma trials we were doing, I said, well, I'm doing the work. Let me be the PI. And so what happens is going to investigator meetings and going to other meetings, making contacts with people led to other opportunities. And so getting in on the ground floor, say, at the end of a big clinical trial, like the coronary prevention, primary prevention trial, 
Going to those meetings, I met the people in the 11 other lipid research clinics around the country and was able to sort of get involved in a lot of things. Um, to get a referral base built up, we already had to some extent a referral base, but I increased that by going out and giving talks within the community or maybe sort of within the region. So where there are opportunities to give a talk, um, say at a Grand Rounds at a hospital or go up to some place like Mattoon, Illinois or to Cape Girardeau or some other place to give a talk, built up contacts and referral bases. I mean, to some extent, also being availability, available to take questions and to interact with people. So if people call up and say, I have a patient, you know, can you see this patient or, you know, what should I do, uh, was helpful. Um, and then the other, the other opportunities for creating contacts and being able to build up kind of uh, the kind of referral base and patient population to do clinical trials and to obtain more clinical trials also meant getting involved in community. So I got an opportunity to be on a local AHA community on cholesterol, and from that got into regional AHA and then to a regional community, uh, regional committee at the Missouri Bar, uh, Board of, uh, Board of uh, Department of Health. And going to meetings and actually asking questions and talking meant that somebody asked me to chair the committee. And so, um, it's kind of that kind of thing led from one thing to another. I think the other thing that helped was getting into um, committees on national organizations. Um, I got help from an outside mentor, Neil Stone, to get on an AHA committee, for example. Um, the, other, the other thing is that I did come into a center that already had physician's assistants, dietitians, and a lot of other staff, plus a core laboratory, which we still have. Core Laboratory was able to do searches of people with certain LDL levels and other things in order to recruit people for clinical trials. And so one clinical trial meeting would, and clinical trial would lead to another clinical trial, um, and sometimes would lead to a uh, possibility of, of writing papers. Um, and then I hired a great assistant in about nine, 1984. I've actually known her longer than I've known my husband, um, uh, who is now my research coordinator and a great recruiter. Within the, within the medical school, um, it's been possible to have collaborations with cardiology, um, with radiology, and some other departments to be either on grants or help um, recruit for grants or help consult on grants, um, and that has made a big difference. I think that one of the main things, it, pieces of advice I give when I'm mentoring junior faculty is, is the real significant importance of networking. And so if you actually go out and talk to people at, at national meetings, you can, this will often create opportunities, opportunities for speaking, opportunities for uh, clinical investigations, opportunity for collaborations. Getting on committees means that, um, depending on the amount of work involved, it may be quite worthwhile because, again, you get a chance to get into leadership positions. And if you get into leadership positions in local, regional, national organizations, that is also something that's worthwhile adding to your CEP for promotion. I've had the, the I've been privileged to have external mentors like Neil Stone, who actually got me on the 2013 uh, ACCHA uh, guideline, which started out with the, at the NIH in 2008. Um, so at this point, I now know people all over the place. The other thing was taking the opportunity um, when Gus was asked to go to a meeting to help organize the National Lipid Association, he asked me to go. I basically told him that I would go as me, not as him. and. Um, that helped me get in on the ground floor of a small but rather in, um, useful organization called the National Lipid Association, get on the board, get involved in all the planning, and I ended up being president of the organization, the fifth president. Um, and, again, and that has led to even more contacts um, and possibilities. Um, so basically, to get a national rep reputation um, in an area that's very specific, picking an area, and then however you pick it, um, and then ba basically developing all the relationships, doing the clinical trials, um, 
writing, reviewing, collaborating, um, being involved in patient care so that people know that you are sort of the center to refer the very unusual patient to. Um, uh, and having the collaborations also means that when these patients that are completely uh, unique come and see you, you have the ability to, to get information from other people. Um, so I think that all of this um, can make a difference in how you add things to your clinical education portfolio. And I would recommend that you include every presentation you give anywhere, especially if you're relatively early on, and that, um, that you, know, you also include all the work you do with organizations that contribute to your center. Thanks. Thank you. So Question. I think Anne touched on a number of things that we talk about from a career development standpoint when it comes to national reputation, um, mentorship, and even though there may not be a formally named Lipid Center, it's an area of expertise. And that's really what we're talking about is how do you develop your area of expertise that then enhances your career um, development. Because I think around here, if you say Lipids, everyone thinks of and so that's why I say you may not have a formally named center, but for sure it's that area of expertise. Any specific um, quick questions for Andrew? We'll talk a little bit more about this during the panel discussion. So you haven't developed a center from a variety of marketing perspective. It's not, it makes sense to try to do so, uh, especially trying to get maybe the next generation. Well, I'm working on the next generation. The next generation doesn't seem to be interested. Um, <laughs> the next generation of providers may not be interested. Yes. That's not, there's no mistake. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like, what's the strategy? So, you know, part of it is is being like one person um, and have been in a division that has no money um, makes it a little hard to to create enough volume and enough other things. Mostly, I, we are supported by our pharmaclinical trials. Um, I have one procedure, LDL apheresis, which does help um, in terms of the bottom line. But um, for up until recently, I think that pharma clinical trials were not really thought of as being really great. Um, and so I think that now that there's a lot more interest, possibly it can be leveraged into maybe greater collaborations uh, to make a center. I think that brings up a good point. I mean, and this might be a general. How do you define a center for clinical excellence? Is it related to branding or is it related to the work? Which should come, come first? That's obvious that some people have essentially created one without a formal, formal branding it, and then uh, other people propose you know, branding it before having the work behind it. Does, does the panel have any guidance on that about what they think is best? I think probably the answer is that it varies, but I'd like to get a pick your brains about it. I might have given an opinion about it. Um, it just, um, I don't know, I don't know, but I think it's always good to give stuff specific, right? Like, if you just brand it, you know, we're a, 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 a center for this, and you don't have anyone really doing it, I, I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, so I think you, you definitely need someone like Ann, but. But I do think it's a missed opportunity if you have someone who's a, a, a major leader nationally, they're nationally recognized, or two or three, and you don't do that at a place like Washington. That's my take on it. Because the institutional power is so, it's just so strong that if you do go to the center, people pay attention. Um, I can't, I don't think it's true across all institutions personally, but I think that when you're at a top like center like Washington, it is a unique opportunity to get a critical mass. Yeah, I have the same opinion. Um, as a female cardiologist, turns out you're not intrinsically an expert in taking care of women with heart disease, although many people seem to think that that is an intrinsic ability. So uh, I was once at a sort of mentoring type meeting at ACC, and somebody said, well, how do I write my clinic is a center for excellence in women's heart disease? And the panel was sort of like, well, first you actually have to have expertise in women's heart disease because it's not just being a woman who takes care of other women. Um, just like being any gastroenterologist doesn't intrinsically make you an expert in IV just because you completed GI fellowship. So 
Um, so I think you do have to have substance because people are going to be sending you in the complicated cases. You have to be able to manage those patients well, or your referring physicians are going to see that you don't hold water and it's going to fall apart. You're going to be able to learn as you go. I mean, I think by being a center of expertise, you get all these really complicated cases that come in and nobody knows what to do with. And that's where that networking comes in. You can talk to other experts across the country and sort of learn as you go. But um, so you don't have to know everything and you can learn along the way. I think when you're ready to retire, you're still learning. But you do have to build up, you know, some expert knowledge base before you start that. Yeah, I, I just, and I can understand real quickly, but yeah, I mean, one of the key steps of being an expert is, is uh, deciding to call yourself an expert. Um, and then you also have to, but you, then you have to be willing to back it up, because you do get those more complicated cases. Uh, but you can do it. Um, yeah. And so you sort of use it as, as combined motivation. Um, and then, but then don't wait too long to brand it, because, uh, you, know, you probably are underestimating the expertise that you think you have. I mean, for us, you know, at Washu, we had seven people do an ID, and we, had, we didn't have ever call ourselves an ID center. Um, and and then once you did, then people sort of liked it. So uh, and there's lots of and there's a lot of like Brian said, there's a lot of uh, publicity machine uh, at Washu for the hospital, for the uh, school of medicine that that they have really Yeah, we went to see outreach people. And I actually skipped over some of the slides for the CEP because I thought I was going to leave. Um, but you know, when you're that person of one, don't underestimate yourself as the expert. And getting that, um, you know, really laying that out on your CEP becomes very important because when you have your meetings with your division chief, with your department head. That's where they really see this is your area of focus, and this is where you're becoming that go-to person. So it really kind of starts at the divisional level. So when they look at your CEP and they see, you know, it's talk after talk about IBD, IBD, national meetings, committees, and so forth, that helps start build that reputation within your own center, and then it starts to, I mean, within your own division and department, and then it starts to spread, even if you don't have that formal title of a center over you. But once you develop that expertise, then the next step becomes, well, how do we take this to the next level when we have a center, and then it's expanding. But that CEP is where you really start to capture that, and before you get to that final center point, it starts propelling you along the road to promotion. So if you're coming in as an assistant, you know, really the way you lay that out on the CEP is what gets you to the, to the associate level. Um, let's, okay. Sorry, one follow-up question, too. Are the answers that you gave and, and think of the way you feel that same or different if it's a center of clinical excellence for patient care and referral versus the center for clinical excellence that you may use for research, like if you wanted to brand your research group as uh, clinical excellence? Absolutely. I think so. Can the panel talk about the differences? I think it's similar, actually. Because, um, because you know, you, you kind of want if you're going to do a center and you're going to do patient care, you're going to do an expert patient care. But if also, but if you have patients um, that are needed for clinical trials, or you have investigators initiating trials, if you have that patient body, then you then you have that leverage to get to actually get the clinical trials. Brian? Yeah, I mean, I think that the it depends on who you want, right? And I, I think that it's. It, my, this is my perspective on it. Uh, so I, I, I kind of wear both hats in our center, but I try to imagine, I always imagine that my job could be a lot easier if I split it into two different people. But I don't see that happening. But, but you know, I, I see how a full time clinician who is clinical research could do leverage that clinical research that you do when you have it at in a way to bring substance into the center, right? I mean, you don't have to create it from scratch. Start with it. Um, so you just leverage and you get the right collaborators in to bolster it, and, and vice versa, right? And, and, and it's the, it's not, the kind of the unfortunate uh, kind of unmet opportunities to me are that they don't click together. I see people doing great basic science research uh, that applies to um, disease X, but they're not really collaborating with the person who has a clinic and uses the disease 
defects uh, that well. They are, or you know, and I think that we can leverage that and synergize those things together to package it. Um, to me, really, these centers at a place like this is really rearranging things and optimizing synergies. It's not that you're having to create something completely from scratch, you know. Because we have great clinicians with great science, right? So this isn't like that. Yeah. So what Matt was saying is that there's, you don't have to do a whole lot. You just have to click on the open side. There's a lot of stuff that's there, right? Not oh, for sure, yeah. So, yeah, th um, so I guess we'll talk more formally about this, but um, thanks to Angela and, and, and the uh, faculty development for uh, inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm just going to speak from uh, kind of a, a personal standpoint um, about we've actually expanded the scope of our center. It was originally the Center for the Study of Itch, which is felt a little niche and probably perhaps was. Um, but uh, we've kind of expanded the scope. In, in some ways, I view the original iteration of the center as being kind of a pilot for seeing how where, where this could go. And I think um, it's been quite successful. Uh, the center is very unique in that it really didn't start from, if we're being completely honest, it didn't start from a major kind of clinical demand. It wasn't like IBD in, in, in some sense, there, you know, where there are so many patients we knew that were uh, needed to be served. Uh, we, we actually came from a field that was largely overlooked, which uh, was the field of itch. And it wasn't scientifically or clinically really considered anything very serious or that uh, needed to be addressed. But this actually all changed and it started here in, at WashU in 2007 when uh, uh, the director of the center, uh, uh, Zhu Feng, actually discovered the first itch receptor. And this actually kind of revolutionized, from a basic science standpoint, uh, the field of, of itch biology. And what, what it, this is such a really striking example to me where basic science has brings tremendous value to clinical medicine. Because of this, suddenly there, there was a shift in the thinking of clinicians, but also pharma, that now we can actually target itch. And it suddenly became this thing, and people started doing market analyses. Um, the, the, actually, the leadership here was actually quite visionary. Uh, I have to give particular credit to uh, the chair of anesthesiology, Alex Evers, who really pushed making this actually an interdisciplinary research center uh, that's actually supported by the dean's office. And it was part of this Biomed 21 initiative, and formally uh, became a center in 2011. Um, in 2014, around 2014-3, uh, basic science principal investigators were recruited, including uh, myself. And, uh, and my background is actually, although I'm a clinician, my background is primarily in basic science. So I've really tried to leverage my basic science background into the clinical uh, realm. Now, that doesn't have, it doesn't have to be that way, but that's just how I came about it. Um, I would, though I'm a basic scientist, I was very much recruited to the center to bolster uh, what now became apparent uh, as the uh, clinical demand. So, uh, again, it started with the science, and suddenly patients started coming out of woodwork who have a chronic itch. And um, I'm just putting this up here to kind of highlight, we always try to align our mission with that of the institution. I, I, in general, I find that centers or departments or divisions get in trouble once they forget about what the mission of the institution is. So I always put this up here to remind myself and the audience kind of, you know, do, are we aligning with uh, the uh, the greater um, uh, mission of the institution? And hopefully we, we are. And this is kind of our global mission is that to actually build a cutting edge research program in itch biology fundamentally. Uh, and we've done that uh, through just real basic neuroscience and immunology, uh, particularly in the last five years, and, uh, and to enhance interactions between basic research and clinical studies. And I have to be honest, uh, I think we could do a lot better in this. Um, really, most of this interaction is derived from myself at my clinic, and we've been able to do a lot with this, but uh, I, what we would really like is to invite other clinicians uh, into the field uh, to be a part of this enterprise, and thereby accelerate translational clinical studies at, uh, in itch and to provide novel effective treatments. Um, again, we're using itch as, as kind of a, uh, uh, a simple paradigm and in which we could actually expand this out to a variety of sensory disorders. Um, we, uh, we've been, uh, in terms of clinical, we've been really trying to make this into an internationally recognized specialty care uh, center. Um, again, this is just my clinic though. Uh, this isn't multiple providers. Um, and then advance our mechanistic basic research into first in human studies and, uh, and be a leading center for clinical trials and chronic itch. Um, and so, 
Uh, we really, uh, again, kind of uh, echoing kind of what Matt said, I, I just kind of showed up. Uh, there are no FDA approved drugs for itch. Uh, there are no guidelines. Uh, and uh, it's remarkable that we could even have a clinic in this. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure it makes the cardiologist cringe. <laughs> but dermatology as a field does not have a lot of clinical trials to back up our treatment. So this is something that we, this is kind of our paradigm. But really, I just started a one half day per week clinic. I stopped doing general dermatology, focus, 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 just on chronic itch. Um, we only see seven patients in a half day. I do have a clinical coordinator who I pay for myself now. Um, and we leveraged a background in atopic dermatitis or eczema as an itch disorder. We've been actually really focusing on this other condition called chronic pruritus of unknown origin. Itch actually affects, uh, it underlies so many medical diseases, it's hard to really even say it's just a dermatologic disease. Um, but the, yet there are very few clinics in it. This is a map of where our patients come from. Um, uh, and this is, uh, I think we've had uh, over 40 states now come to our clinic. None of these patients actually have atopic dermatitis. They have this chronic pruritus of unknown origin. Um, the thing that, uh, you know, what's interesting is I'm coming from, again, from a different vantage point. I, I think that what we're doing is actually a, kind of the leading edge of unrecognized diseases. And I, I see actually very unique opportunities for centers in that area because no one else is doing it. And if you're doing it just by default, you're going to have to become the hub. Right. But the barrier there for clinicians is, oh, I don't want to do that, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or chronic cough, you know, cl clinicians say, well, I don't know about that. It's a little weird. It's off the grid. It's not in uh, Harrison's, right? So, but, um, but I think that's where the opportunity is. That's my personal take. It, I think this is actually a lot easier for me than, than some of these established diseases because we're not even competing here. We're, we're just opening it up, you know, and people are flooding in, right? Um, but, you know, we've, you know, in some playful ways and some more serious ways, we've been able to actually, um, you know, get a lot of national and international attention from the clinic. We've um, really mapped out new diseases, identified new uh, mutations, um, published solid basic science papers, all involved. This is, these are all papers involving patients. So, you know, whether it's in cell or in clinical trials. Um, and we've been able to collaborate with the basic scientists in our centers to enhance the, uh, the impact of their work. Um, and this is really, you know, just from our clinic has been very fruitful. We've been able to actually uh, secure unique funding uh, opportunities, particularly from pharma, uh, that's both translational as well as clinical. Um, it's really, we've been able to highlight uh, the market opportunities, not just in diseases like atopic dermatitis as a result of this, but also uh, just itch in general. So now pharma is completely onto this. Uh, this morning I was on a conference call, an indication that we've kind of coined, uh, three pharma companies are now going after in clinical trials. So, uh, you know, I think we can really impact the field. Uh, and these are some early biotech that are actually ex exclusively focused just on itch. Uh, and they've uh, become much more emboldened from a lot of the kind of uh, 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 the data that we put out from, from our center. And uh, there are opportunities in industry sponsors. This is just from our clinic as well as investigating initiated uh, clinical trials. Um, we, I was actually able to design a clinical trial for the first topical JAK inhibitor, which actually is likely to be approved in the next year and a half. Uh, a phase two that led, is now led to uh, phase three. Um, and we are also innovating. We, we have great collaborations going on with, uh, this is Dina Katabi, who's actually a MacArthur fellow at MIT, who does, uh, uh, a, she really does AI, doesn't just say she does, she actually is a true leader in AI and um, is finding ways to actually diagnose and assess itch in patients using AI technology that she actually invented. Um, she actually, her device was actually, um, is able to predict when patients are actually going to fall at home. So it's actually amazing. The computer can actually, the robot can actually figure out who's at risk for falling in, in, in a quantitative way. So it has huge implications for even primary care. Um, and, you know, what, what do we need to do? We, we really need more clinicians um, in this center. I think in contrast to Matt, you have like so many people doing IVD, which is incredible. Yeah, you still need more, right? Yeah, but we—it's just me right now, and 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 we're trying to expand this actually out to um, to other sensory disorders. The, the, the lesson that we learned is that if you start doing an, a really unmet need, especially a place like this, I mean, again, people flood in, and it's just amazing, and and you're immediately at the forefront of it. 
And so there are other disorders that I look at and I think, gosh, we're really not capitalizing on it, whether it's migraine headaches, vertigo, tinnitus, you know, because the, I mean, the future of medicine really, in my mind, is a lot of quality of life now. I mean, we're, we're doing a pretty good job extending life, uh, but now, but that's really opened up these uh, disorders that are highly prevalent, we've really ignored. So, um, you know, we really like to think of ourselves as a quaternary referral center. I mean, we have patients coming in who've seen six, seven dermatologists uh, at other academic centers that come to our center uh, as well. So um, hopefully that highlights a bit of a roadmap, um, particularly for unmet, highly unmet conditions like itch. So. It's been the same. Um, so yeah, it's I, I literally see seven patients in a half day. Okay, um, every, week. every week, yeah. And it, the rest of the time is in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. But um, we focused literally on two diseases and really this chronic price of unknown origin. We can fill our site faster than any general dermatology site in the country because we're so specialized. We have, you know, we basically have a whole, you know, a whole, you know, platform, you know, we have all these patients that we know inside out, right, that have chronic itch, they've flown in from, so, so now that these companies are actually going to trials, you know, we're, we're a major site even with, with seeing so few patients. Um, and anyone who does clinical trials has, knows this, like, you know, your, your sites will say, oh yeah, we have those patients. And then when you actually go to enroll, it's a lousy enrollment, right? But this is all we do. And I, and I think for me, the, the, uh, I've been very fortunate because I'm a basic scientist has afforded me kind of the, the kind of courage in some ways because I can always fall back on the science to clinically really focus and, you know, put all my eggs in one basket. And it's actually turned out to be much better than if I'd done anything else, right? Um, uh, it's really allowed us to open this up. So it's not a lot. So um, I will say we're recruiting clinicians across all specialties in medicine to the center. So please let me know if people are interested. But, <laughs> you know, so uh, we actually, you know, I, I talked with Vicki Frazier. I said, can we get FTEs for a cough clinic? You know, you, you, chronic cough is exactly the same. How many chronic cough clinics are there in the country? Zero. Right, so it's the exact same thing as urge clinic. So you know, there's a huge opportunity for someone in pulmonary or allergy to do that. But you know, there are other a lot of these uh, unmet needs that we just have not formed even a clinic. Forget about a center. Just make a start with a clinic, right? Um, and so we see that opportunity here. No, you know, it's the the receptor. Uh, yeah, I want to go go back. It's not that the receptor is so important, which it is. Uh, you know, we have a big collaboration with Malincrot to, 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 you know, for development of antagonists for that pathway. But subsequently, that was really the first itch receptor that was discovered. Th three more were discovered in our center subsequently, including from our lab. But what it has done is, what, what that did was it, it just opened this kind of thinking. Yeah, it was weird. It's, it's, it sounds crazy, but it created a shift in the, in the conceptual framework, most notably of industry. And, and that really trickled back into, and, and I can't, um, you know, some people don't talk about industry very seriously, but I mean, boy, do they, th when they get interested, it affects us tremendously. Suddenly money starts flowing, patients start flowing, you know, things start happening. And it's, and it's definitely done that for us. So I, I think there's really strong ways we can collaborate with industry. I mean, because they paved the regulatory pathway, because we're dealing with a disease where people are saying, I'm not so sure if it's a disease. I think. These people are just crazy, right? Well, but there's there's a way to map this out, um, and uh, you can't do that alone in, in academia. You know, we're not going to be able to uh, deal with the FDA at that level that the way that these people do when they decide they're going to do a phase two trial. You know, yep. Uh, so, how do you manage? You mentioned that you see seven patients in a clinic, and presumably there's a large unmet need for these patients. So, how? Do you encounter issues with wait times and the frustrations yeah. with that? Yeah, um, we have a long, we don't have a one I, I still have a six month wait. I mean, the issue is that, you know, I, you know, if I open up more clinics, I'm just gonna ruin my basic science career. Um, so, you know. Have you developed certain strategies to handle that? No, 
No, I mean, I mean the, 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 you know, the, the strategy that we're working on is to recruit more clinicians. Yeah. You know, that, that's the only answer, right? And what I'm trying to convince clinicians now is that they could come in and do the clinical part and take over the trials. Like, I'm not actually a trialist, and I never intended to be. It's just that I know that discoveries don't make their way to the patients just because, you know, you publish a good paper, right? Um, so... So we're trying to take it all the way to the patients, but I think others can do this um, in, a, in a very impactful way. And I, I mean, I have to turn down advisory boards galore. I mean, I can't do nine out of 10 things I'm asked to do now, right? So I, to me, that's a, just a huge opportunity. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that will transition from Ryan to Kate is this idea of unmet need, developing that area of expertise, developing something around unmet need and taking that forward from the standpoint of career development. So um, Kate? Okay, so um, speaking of which, um, I think the first thing, the, the two first things that I thought were gonna be necessary for developing a center of excellence was number one, um, it had to actually be an area that there was need for. Um, and number two, I felt that it was important that it be something I'd be passionate about because it actually takes a lot of work um, to develop a center of excellence. Um, and it, it's sort of ongoing work and it, you want it to be something that you actually love doing because otherwise I think you'll burn out from doing it. And so um, I actually started sort of the idea of wanting to develop the, the Women's Center when I was a second year fellow. And so I started talking to people within my division and my division chief. And what I, what I was really the most interested in is taking care of pregnant women with heart disease. And, so I sort of went to other sort of senior people in my division and said, so I'm really interested in taking pregnant women with, taking care of pregnant women with heart disease. Is this like a viable career pathway? Are there actually enough patients to take care of? And I got a lot of blank stares, like I have no idea if there are actually enough patients for you to take care of or not. Um, and so I talked to the people in the congenital group and they said, well, we maybe take care of three or four patients a year. And I thought, well, pff, three or four patients a year is clearly not going to be enough to sustain, sustain a career. So I actually just on advice of um, different people, senior people in my division started making cold crawls across the country. And some of those people would say, well, that's not really what I do, but try calling this person. And they would say, well, that's not really what I do, but try calling this person. So I just like made cold calls to actually really important people <laughs> across the country until I found some people who actually said, yeah, that's actually what I do. And we see this many patients a year. Um, and so it turns out um, after doing a little investigation, oops, does this actually work? No, does this not? That? Okay, there we go. Um, it, it turns out cardiovascular disease is actually the leading killer of women. And um, it's actually typically under-recognized and under-treated in women. And um, cardiovascular disease actually affects women differently than it affects men. So it actually, there, it actually affects a large segment of the population. And there is a lot of value in having expertise in knowing how to recognize and properly treat those specific conditions that affect women. Um, Secondly, related to my specific interest in taking care of pregnant women, um, although most um, industrialized countries are having improvements in their maternal mortality rates, as you can see here, the United States stands out uh, yet again in that um, we actually have drastically rising maternal mortality rates and cardiovascular disease actually accounts for between a quarter to a third of those deaths. So, um, and those rates are continuing to go up as moms are getting older and having more cardiovascular risk factors as they become pregnant. So not only is it a large unmet need, it's actually gonna continue to grow in the future. And the other thing that I actually did not remember, and I don't think I ever learned in medical school, 
was that um, a lot of the pregnancy-related complications, such as preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, um, which ultimately affect about 25% of women, and preeclampsia itself affects about 15% of the patients here who deliver at Barnes-Jewish Hospital, they're actually major risk factors for future cardiovascular disease in women. And these are really under-recognized, under-screened for, and under-treated. And so this has actually really become the focus of my clinical research. Um, and so I found that there actually was a huge need that was completely unmet here and actually in most major academic institutions. And so I found that there was going to be actually a substantial basis for developing this as my career niche. And I definitely already had the passion for it. Um, I had a very hard time deciding in medical school if I wanted to be an OBGYN or if I wanted to be an internist. Um, and I spent my whole fourth year doing half medicine rotations and half OBGYN rotations, but turns out I really didn't enjoy pelvic surgery, probably just because all you get to do is hold the bladder blade at that point. But um, I decided I wanted to go into internal medicine and do women's health. And unfortunately, I get, got bit by the cardiology bug, which I thought was the exact opposite of doing women's health. Um, and I wanted to find a way to bring all those interests back together. And this actually was a way for me to really tie those things together nicely. And I take care of pregnant women every single day of my life now, and I'm very involved in all the OBGYN societies, and I never have to do a pelvic exam. So I really feel like I won. Um, <laughs> This is one of my patients and her baby. I thought for sure she was gonna have a growth restricted baby and it came out like a toddler. So. Um, so, and as I was referring to earlier, I think you need both a need and a passion, but you also need to have expertise. The great news is everyone in this room is really bright and so everyone can develop that expertise. And you probably already have a basis of it if you're thinking about developing a center for, of excellence. But I knew that if I was going to develop this center, I had to have something to back it up, and I didn't want to completely learn it all on the fly. So um, fortunately, I was early enough in my training that I had time to actually get a lot of focused expertise um, before I actually started my job. So I um, was able to really focus my third year of my training on learning how to take care of pregnant women with cardiovascular disease. So I spent my third year in the congenital heart disease clinic um, because obviously congenital patients are young and they tend to have pregnancies. Um, I made up my own consult service during the third year, which all of my co-fellows teased me about appropriately. But I basically went to labor and delivery and gave them my pager number and said, if you have a consult, call me instead of the service. And then I would just find a random attending to staff with. And there were a couple consult attendings who were nice and supportive and didn't mind me doing the work. And they got to bill for the RVUs. And so it worked out fine. Um, and so basically, I got a lot of sort of inpatient um, experience by doing that sort of my own consult service that year. Um, and plus, I got to build a relationship with the OBGYN group as well. I also, through all those cold calls, found someone else at Emory who does what I do. And I went and spent a month with her, learning from her. And that also was a nice connection for me during this first few years where I was still learning a lot on the job. So when I'd have a patient come to me and I didn't know what to do, I would call her and she would give me some advice. Um, and then I also set up rotations with the pulmonary hypertension group and maternal fetal medicine groups so I could really try to gain as much exposure as possible. And now I presume everybody in this room is already on the job, so you can't set up these nice rotations like this, but you still have the opportunity to read as much as you can and collaborate with other people who have expertise and to make those connections with other people who are already experts in the field. And you, you can learn and get yourself up to speed pretty quickly. And the next thing I wanted to do was um, to develop a vision for what I wanted, um, wanted this center to be. And so from a bird's eye view, I wanted to become a nationally recognized center of excellence in women's heart disease. And so um, I looked to see who else is doing things similar to this, and I reached out to those people. So there's um, a nice center at Cedars-Sinai that Noel Barry Mers runs, and there's a nice center at MGH that Melissa Wood runs. And so I reached out to people who run these other centers, and I got to know them and what they're doing, and I learned from them, and I figured out what are they doing well that I can emulate, and what do I think I can improve upon? Because I want to be um, on the same tier as them, and actually I want to do things even better than them, because I want to make ours really the best. Um, and then on a little bit more of a ground level view, 
Um, I really see that there's, and, and this was already mentioned earlier um, by Matt as well, I really saw three main um, tiers or three main columns to build this center. One is, and really the largest is patient care, but also education and research are huge components of the center. And I think that if you're gonna really build a great center, you need all three of these components. Of course, we need great patient care. That's where, and that's how you get recognized. You need to have patients coming in to see you, and then you can use those patients as a part of your clinical research trials. But also part of what you're doing is to educate um, the patients and the community and the next generation of providers and also the people you're working with so that we can all take better care of patients and sort of multiplies what you do so that you, know, you can train more people to come up and to work with you and train people to go out to other major institutions and emulate what you're doing because we're really trying to sort of further patient care and improve how we're taking care of patients over the long run. Um, and then I think that research is really an important component. My goal in life was actually to never do any research. And it turns out I don't have enough time to do research now because um, the more I started taking care of these patients, I started running into questions that I didn't know the answers to. And I realized we're really important for taking really good care of patients. And I also realized that the more I thought critically about things and did good research, the better I was able to take care of patients. And so I think to run a really comprehensive center, you have really have to interlink the research and the patient care. They really run side by side. And honestly, if you're doing research and publishing, people are gonna recognize you for that work and it builds your national reputation and patients wanna come places that are nationally recognized and they wanna come places where the trials are being done. So I think all three of those components are really important. And most importantly, um, I think since I take care of a lot of pregnant women, people think of me as running the Women's Center and I guess I sort of spearheaded it, but. I really view this as a group effort, and I think um, sort of similar to what others have been saying too, um, you really need to figure out who are your key stakeholders and key collaborators here within the hospital and reach out to those people and integrate them completely into the matrix of the program. Um, this is just really the key people who are involved in our program, but also, you know, geneticists and um, and other groups of people are in behavioral health are also very much involved um, with our program. But, you know, identify a key person or several key people from the different divisions that you're gonna need to really make the program great and involve them in patient care and in the research and in, in education and in doing so, it makes the patient care and the research better, but it also advances both your career and their career. You kind of work together and make it a win-win for everybody. And then the last thing you do after you get things together is you really have to sell your program. Certainly doing great research and publishing that great research is a great way to sell your program, but there are also a lot of other ways you can do it. Um, it is terrifying to go on television. It's actually live, which they didn't tell me the first time I went on. I thought I was gonna like get outtakes, but you don't. But take every opportunity to do that. I turn down the ones that have nothing to do with my area of expertise because I don't have time for it. But the things that have anything related to my program, I take all of those opportunities because your patients will see you on TV and they will wanna come because their doctor was on TV and they tell people about it and other people come in because they see you talking about it. And it's also a great way to educate the public about important topics. Um, I actually on Twitter just sort of recently and I actually have found it to be a really useful way to build my network and sell what we're doing here. Um, it's a purely professional Twitter page, but you can really, you know, share your knowledge that you have on there. It's a little bit scary. You think there's all these other experts on there, but you share your knowledge and it's a really like close up way to be in touch with other really leading experts. And, um, and so you can share knowledge and share um, studies that you've done or studies that other people are doing. And you can also share things that you're doing. We just recently opened a postpartum hypertension clinic um, in collaboration with our OBGYN colleagues. And um, 
you know, it's really a great effort that we did and was really well received um, amongst other people in cardiology and OBGYN. And then lastly, as was also mentioned, get involved in your, um, in your societies because it's really a great way to network and also to find mentorship and sponsorship. So there is no one here at WashU doing what I'm doing and I'm a relatively junior faculty member and so I have mentorship from some aspects here, but really the people who give me the most mentorship in this area are from all across the country. And so by getting involved in the ACC, I've been able to meet other people who do this and who've been able to give me, you know, leadership opportunities or speaking opportunities. And it really does help advance your career and the work that you're doing. Um, and so I'm really excited that at the ACC, which hopefully doesn't get canceled by the coronavirus, we're actually going to be leading a, a really large talk on cardioobstetrics, which is, I think, really great for the, for the topic. Um, I'm not actually sure that I have any idea what I'm doing, but I just sort of keep doing it. And um, it seems like all these other people are doing the same things that I'm doing, even though maybe none of us know what we're doing, but it seems to be working so far. So. We've done it both ways. Um, so we have a, a multidisciplinary family planning clinic where um, I go to family planning's area and we see them together. Most of the patients who are pregnant, we see separately, but I have set up my clinic days um, to match when they have theirs, and so that patients can coordinate their appointments. And then if there's something like really critical, we'll just call on the phone. Our specialties are so different, like they need to do pelvic exams and put in IUDs, and I need to like do EKGs, and so it's a little bit hard to get like the procedural things done in the same place. So we've opted to keep those separate, but coordinate the times. And, um, and then the postpartum hypertension clinic, we have that all in the OBGYN space. And then um, our division just rents out a portion of their time, of the clinic space time. Can I call an audible? Sure. I think you've heard four examples of centers. And really, the time here is for you guys. So if you want to learn about the Healthcare Innovation Lab, go to healthcare, healthcareinnovationlab.org. Contact me and tell you all about it. But I, we're kind of here to help them yeah. on the CEP. So why can don't you, you just, take the time just, to do well, CEP? Can you just give them a, just a one minute of what the Healthcare Innovation Lab is? Yes. One minute. In service of BJC Healthcare and Washington <laughs> University School of Medicine, the Healthcare Innovation Lab catalyzes care delivery innovation through research and development. So unlike my colleagues here who work in basic science or work in clinical care, we think about the system of care. How are we set up to deliver care, be it in itch, be it in women's health, be it in lipids, and um, recognize that a lot of the new Technologies that are out there, digital technologies, virtual visits, remote patient monitoring technologies, can be really interesting and helpful adjuncts to the way we deliver care. So that's what we do. We do it in conjunction with both of these organizations, and I'm happy to tell you more about it. But I would say a lot of the lessons learned and shared from my four colleagues about how you build it, how you brand it, how you grow the footprint of it, um, I, I would echo. So I think that, you know, the common thing is that people have an area, uh, you know, something that they were passionate about, an unmet need, and then how do you take that and develop into an area of expertise where you become the person, sort of the go-to person, and then use that for your career development. So what questions other do you guys have for our, our panelists in that regard? Or for me in regards to like CET. In BKC, I watch you, uh, do you need to apply for internal grant to promote the branding within or outside watch you? Or you just create your own page and start doing the Twitter approach? Uh, uh, I'll, the, the way we've done it is <clears throat> a little bit of both. So we, we had an outside group help us build the web page, for example. 
by, I think maybe Brian or somebody said, there's a lot of resources, both on the WashU and BJC side, both public affairs offices will provide a lot in terms of media contacts. Um, they actually have some, they have a studio over in the tab where they can do things like interviews or they can help you with, uh, with other kinds of press. I'd also say don't underestimate the, the value of so social media. Um, there really is a, a big brand opportunity there too. What, what have you guys found? Both, both of the WashU and BJ Media Relations still do a lot of mailings, and a lot of that is department and division driven. So when something is new, um, often the department will contact media relations or media relations will get wind of it, and then they will feature you either in the newsletters and the mailings, um, you know, just to kind of help initially get that word out there. But a lot of it is both, you know, so building your web page, you're on your own to do that part of it. Well, you're, yeah, you're, you're kind of you're kind of on your own. I mean, there is actually a system that will help you set up a, a web page as well and give you some flexibility. If you want to put any patient-facing related website or other things like that, you have to go through uh, the, you know, there's like a collaboration, I guess, the faculty practice plan, but BJ, C, or H, and, uh, and WashU work together. And I thought it was kind of a hassle initially, but they did make things look better. And they put their brands, you know, stuff all over it, but they still allowed us to have flexibility. But you have to go through them um, to if you're gonna put it patient facing in some fashion or another. On the question of social media, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, particularly for the disease that I'm looking at, uh, and I've worked through other diseases, too, there are Facebook groups where patients will kind of get together and they have this common disease and they're talking about it. As clinicians, how do you leverage that kind of uh, resource? You know, you don't feel like you're a and you will start talking to patients on Facebook and tell them you're an expert. Like, is there a way to, how do you kind of use that group that's there for their own ideas like that? You can set up a professional Facebook page and keep it completely separate as a professional Facebook page. Um, I that, that patients, that. you expect that patients will kind of search and find you? Or you can join through yeah. actually as a professional. I haven't done that, actually, keep Facebook, like, for pictures of my kids and my dogs or <laughs> my like, friends and family, and I keep Twitter, it's, like, completely professional. Right, yeah, I mean, that's, so I, I got on Twitter for that reason, too, but um, what I'm realizing is when you see that I'm, like, my focus is on the media things, and we're working on the media production and going over the next year. Um, it's a rare disease, it's a genetic disease. But you know, when I, I, I started seeing patients in the clinic already, and from them I, I found out that there are actually a whole group of patients mm -hmm. on the Facebook, which I was not aware of. And then I said, yeah, we, I mean, we have a, a IBD Center Facebook page, and, okay. and uh, again, you're supposed to register this with Washington University in some way or another, and they recommend that you have to post something once, it's like once a month you have to post something, mm -hmm. uh, with the idea that. You can't just have a site out there that's languishing. Okay. Uh, that being said, there's some months where I haven't published anything and there's never been anyone who's, who's come down. So you have to but, go through the washroom to set up a Facebook? No, you can set it up yourself, but you have to tell them. Okay. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a hassle. It's ultimately worth it, I think. Yeah. Because you get the power of the brand. You don't okay. accidentally, two years down the road, have somebody come and slap your wrist. Okay. And I think there's value. They also, I don't know if you experienced this, but they have some good tips. Frequency of posting. You're going to have to be careful if you're talking to patients you don't accidentally pretend to set up a therapeutic relationship. Right? That's, right? That's there's legal be things. Kind of so they can advise you on that and help you sort of navigate those waters. But um, if you go that route, I think you can find it to be an effective tool. Yeah, we have people, we haven't set up with, no one else, it's not like they can post on our page mm -hmm. even if they can like. It's, you set it up not as a personal page, you set it up as something that, uh, that people can like. Uh, anyway, don't make them guys you want. Uh, I have two questions. One, Brian, you're the co-director. How did you guys get uh, Dean, and I guess that was before you were here, but yeah. uh, you know, Dean's support for this, which clearly worked, worked out would be one thing. And then for everybody, just a comment of there's a lot of push now from, um, I guess, from a variety of, of uh, angles where people want to have a patient advisory board or some or a patient, you know, you, you talked uh, about your, you know, all the various people that you're connected with, but also having a patient, um, 
advisory board, and if anyone has any comments on that. So, Brian, yes, you want me to Yeah, that, that was easy. Um, it was an initiative. I don't think it's in existence. Uh, Angela might know better too, but I don't think the initiative is currently open. Um, but I could be wrong. But it was an initiative from the other team, the, the prior team, and it was it was basically a multidisciplinary center. So the idea of the theme was that it's multidisciplinary. And you needed buy-in from multiple departments. So it couldn't just be Department of Medicine. It had to be like Department of Medicine plus the anesthesiology. And that was kind of it was a thematic. And then they're called IRCs because they're in a interdisciplinary center. So that was really the, the concept. Um, and there was financial support, um, but I think the value from that was, you know, I mean, you folks might disagree with me, but uh, it was more kind of a, that it was also there was a lot of spiritual support for it. You know, the, the concept. Yeah, that initiative is used research um, uh, regards to patients, patients like patient faculty advisory committee or something, I think what you're talking about, we don't have that for the women's center. We're technically supposed to have it for the congenital center. Um, there is like a larger one, which I think is for like internal medicine or cardiology in general or something, which we sort of piggybacked on to sort of say we have it because we have to for ACHA accreditation. but. I don't think we've really found it. It's not something we've really been very engaged in. Yeah, so the, I would say the biggest thing from the advisory boards is if you're engaged in research, that's in, um, to have a community, we call it a community advisory board, um, even at the basic science level, um, just to support um, community engagement around research. And the idea is to have the input that it's something that's relevant, equitable, you know, the whole nine yards and then, you know, support the recruitment as well. I'd just like to chime in the, if, if people are asking about community advisory boards or having questions about setting up the HIV clinic in infectious diseases, this has had a long standing one for decades. So um, I think Rachel Presti is involved in it um, quite a bit. So um, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer emails from anybody about how it was set up. And I know they had issues before with lack of participation in things as well. So even after it's set up, there's issues too. Um, but it, it does work well. I, I know from the Cronson Class Foundation just put forward a few new big grant mechanisms that, and one of the requirements is having uh, is having community, some sort of community. Uh, so you can get assistance to that through the ICTS as well. Other questions? So I, this one, I. I'm sure everyone's going to have different answers to as well, but um, it sounds like a substantial amount of work to do this, and it requires more than one person, unless you're incredibly dedicated. Um, how do you get the additional money, um, in your opinion, or what's the best way to get it to um, set up your center for clinical excellence? Is it on the backs of doing uh, patient care, or asking dean for money, applying for grants, foundation rewards, all of the above? Do you have? Uh, about that well, yeah, I mean, mine is funded mostly, uh, um, you know, in part the fact that, I, that I'm a funded investigator and, and I get paid less than uh, a full time clinician. And I think the university puts that all into a system now. I think there's some divisional support for, uh, there's friendly divisional support for some of my crime uh, now as well. Uh, but, but really, you know, you have to. You have to figure out how you, you know, how you fit that in. And it sounds like Brian is sort of make sure that he's limits how much uh, effort he puts into certain things. But you have to, you have to scope it out yourself for sure and see. Um, you know, there's going to be some sweat equity at the beginning, defining what it is that you really want to do, and then I think you have to present it to department and divisional leadership and see if there is buy-in and some buy-in for your time. And typically. It's it's for a limited period of time, and then you see how you move, how you grow things. But you do have to have some sort of relative business plan. I mean, I don't have any funding from anybody. You know, no farmer wants to give money to take care of pregnant ladies with heart problems. So, um, I mean, I just take care of patients basically, and then I apply for separate grants for my research 
funding or for research funding that I do. But I mean, when I first started, I saw a lot of patients that weren't in my niche to like pay the bills. And then as I got busier, then I started filtering out the other like general cardiology patients and expanding the, the, the you know my clinical niche. So that's now pretty much all I see. But I don't have any like departmental funding or pharma funding or anything like that to pay for the center. Since it's right at one o'clock, um, so to be respectful of everyone's time, thank you all for coming. I would say if you have any additional questions for any of the panelists specifically, to reach out to them. And if you have any questions about your CV, your CEP, how to capture these type of activities on your CEP, to reach out to me. Thank you.